All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome back to our Parsha Pardes class. I know we've been a little bit spotty on this class the last few weeks, but I'm very happy that we can get to it this week as um, Parsha Ski Teitze. This week's Parsha is filled with mitzvahs. It is the uh, single Parsha with the most mitzvahs of Torah. 74 commandments are in this week's Parsha which means that more than 10% of all of the mitzvahs, 10% of all the commandments are in this week's Parsha. Um, obviously, I encourage you to explore the Parsha on your own so you get to all the mitzvahs, many of which are relevant in everyday life, some of which perhaps less relevant in everyday life, but all of which are fascinating and, and, uh, and sheer very important, whether it's, mitzvahs that we should observe or values that we can follow um it is certainly a partial worth spending investing time in to understand the section that i want to focus on a little bit um is a, a practical area of torah but also i mean this is a one of those we call this class the parsha pardes class because we go through the orchard of Torah, Pshat, Remez, Drush, and Soy, the simple meaning, the deeper ideas the, that we, which we can derive, as well as the secrets of Torah. So there's no question that this section of the Torah includes elements of all four angles of the Torah. And that's what, uh, that's what we're going to do. And we're talking about the second Aliyah, chapter 21, verse number 22, which I have here on the screen in front of you. Um, so chapter 21, verse number 22. Begins with the following words. Um, if a man commits a sin for which the, he is sentenced to death, chapter 21, verse 22, and you shall hang him on a pole. Okay, so this is a uh, part of of the Torah law, which is not well known and perhaps not very comfortable to talk about, but the idea that according to Torah law, if and when the basin uh, carried out capital punishment, which was very infrequent, if you look in the Talmud, the Talmud says there was uh, uh, almost never, almost never, according to one opinion of the Talmud, uh, even a basin that, that killed someone once every 70 years was considered to be unusual. But in the event, in the circumstance in which someone was killed for their sins, so they would actually have to hang the body on a pole. That was the, uh, that's the mitzvah. Uh, now, if you look in the Talmud, the Talmud then describes how this was carried out, that it was done for literally an instant, for, 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 for a few seconds. The body was then um placed on the pole and then taken down and then immediately buried which is the next mitzvah verse 23 mm -hmm. do not leave the body hanging overnight but rather you shall bury the body on that day. Because a human corpse is a blasphemy to God. And do not defile your land, the land which God gave you as inheritance. Let's look at Rashi. Again, verse 23. It says Rashi, a very profound idea. Zilzuloi shel melech. This is embarrassing to the king. What, why is the body languishing an embarrassment to the king? Is because the human being is created in the image of God. Then it gives an interesting parable. This can be comparable to two identical twin brothers, one of whom became king and the other was arrested for robbery and hung, hanged. Whoever saw him, the second brother, would say, oh, the king is hanging. Therefore, the king ordered and they removed him. So you hear over here the idea that the body, the the body, we're not even talking about the human being as it's, as it is alive, but the dead body is a reminder of God because we are created in the image of God. 
it's for a different time and place what what that means the being created in the image of God. But be that be that as it may, it's enough that the body is a reminder of God, and therefore the body hanging, the body le le being left alone, not tended to, is a an embarrassment to God, which is why we uh, bury, we do our best to carry out, uh, to make sure that a body is buried immediately. This, this pasuk over here is the source of the concept of burial altogether. Even though we have, even though the exact situation the Torah is talking about is a situation in which a person was killed for their capital crimes. But nonetheless, this becomes the source of the mitzvah of burial. As the Gemara in Sanhedrin says, the Talmud tractate Sanhedrin, Daf Membavam Abeis 46b, Amar Rabbi Yochanan Mishumim Shimer by Yochai, Rabbi Yochanan says the name of Shimer by Yochai. Where is the source of burial? What is the source of burial in the Torah? We have many mitzvahs in the Torah, but where does the Torah tell us of the obligation of burial? Talmud Lomar, this pasuk Kafartik Berenu. That they should be buried. And this is the source of the Jewish idea of burial. Um, the Jerusalem Talmud says that it is a positive commandment, a mitzvah say, to be buried. Um, Sana, your question, which you posed over here, is this mitzvah only apply to Jewish body or anyone to bury on the same day? This mitzvah, the mitzvah and all the mitzvahs connected to burial is specifically for a Jewish body. And the idea of burial immediately is connected to a Jewish body. Now, others may want to adopt. Now, that's just the mitzvah. That's the mitzvah. But let's talk a little bit about what's the reason for this mitzvah. You know, well, you know when it comes to a mitzvah, the first thing we have to say it's a mitzvah. So that Hashem wants. In some, some mitzvahs, we also have the opportunity to explore the reasoning behind the mitzvah. You know, right now we started blowing shofar. So right away, if you look in the laws of shofar, and uh, the Rambam Shemarah says, you know, we blow the shofar. Why do we blow the shofar? Everyone has answers to why we blow the shofar. It's a wake-up call. It's an alarm clock. It's a call from the heart. There's all sorts of beautiful ideas. But you look in the Shulchan Aruch, the Rambam, why do we blow the shofar? Because Hashem says, you blow the shofar in Rosh Hashanah. That's why we blow the shofar. Beyond that, there are ideas and reasons and, and deeper concepts you can explore. So to over here, the idea of burial, first and foremost, is a mitzvah. What's the reason for this mitzvah? So we come across different reasons, and I and I think it's important to highlight the fact that highlight the fact that it's even though it is just one of six hundred and thirteen commandments, we do find certain mitzvahs that seem to take have extra focus and extra emphasis on their observance, and this is one of them. For Jewish people, the concept of a Jewish burial has always been something that we've gone to great lengths and great degrees of sacrifice to ensure a proper burial as much and whenever possible. Today, it happens to be uh, September 11th. We're now 21, removed, 21 years removed from the uh, greatest terror attack on American soil. And um, as you probably know, there were many, many Jews who were in the uh, victims of the of um, September 11th. And one of the challenging tasks in the aftermath of September 11th was the uh, collecting DNA, all sorts of questions that came up, halachic questions, and the ability for some, there was there was no burial whatsoever. But some who, uh, for some who were killed, then they merited to have burial, at least to some degree, the burial of body parts. So this mitzvah is, is again continues to be relevant till today. Um, and to today in particular, when there is a uh, becoming more rising popularity of the concept of cremation, so it's more important than ever to highlight the Jewish value of burial. So there's really two steps over here. One is the idea of burial, and the second idea is immediate burial. Those are two different things. So let's let's kind of focus on each of them individually. Why is burial important? And secondly, why is immediate burial important? So again, the first answer, which we just said, is because it's a mitzvah. But beyond that, our sages do share different ideas 
connection in connection to um, in connection to this mitzvah. One idea that is shared is that that burial and returning the body to the earth, and I use the word returning, is base is basically the idea the Torah tells us of returning an object. The Heshiva Sagzel, the Torah says you should return a lost, we have the, a mitzvah to return a lost object, you have a mitzvah to return a stolen object, but returning the object to the ground is based on this idea that the body comes from Hashem. And furthermore, if you look at the beginning of Torah, the, uh, the body is made from the earth. That's where the name Adam comes from. Adam comes from the word Adama, which means earth. And therefore, God gives us a body and gives us a certain amount of time. We don't know exactly how long, but God gives us a body for a certain amount of time. And when that time ends, God says, okay, now give it back. And giving it back means returning it to the earth from where it came from. So it's simply returning an object that belongs to Hashem. And the reason that's so significant is because it's it doesn't just inform us about death. It informs us about life. This is not just a mitzvah which affects how a person dies. It's a mitzvah how it affects a person lives. Because if a person lives with the value that my body belongs to Hashem, so you live differently. Practically, there's certain mitzvahs, obligations, and prohibitions about the body. And, uh, and uh, one can argue, you know, no one's business what I do with my body. You can say that about many mitzvahs. Even though it's of kosher, right? Eating. Who's, it's no one's business what I eat, what I drink. I'm not hurting anyone. It's just myself, my body. Today, uh, today there is a, a quote, if you want to call it a slogan, my body, my choice. But Torah does not accept that. Torah does not accept the notion of my body, my choice. It's not your body. And this is one of the mitzvahs, and this mitzvah maybe highlights it more than others. This is a mitzvah which basically says it's Hashem's body. God gave it to you to use. God gave it to you with the mission. The mission is over. The time is up. Okay, the body should be buried. And that's why it's it's not just any mitzvah. It's a mitzvah which contains a very deep Jewish value. Interestingly, the sages point out that if you look according to Torah, the Torah system, that which I own, my property, belongs to me more so than my body. So if I work hard and I, uh, and I make money and then I buy a car, the car actually belongs to me. And I can do whatever I want to the car. There's no Torah law about how to treat your car. The car is yours. It's yours. You're, obviously, if you're talking about a living being, there's an there's a obligation of kindness. But as long as it's not a living being, there's no obligation. You can do whatever you want to your car. Paint it whatever colors you want. Whatever engravings, it, whatever you want, you put in your car. But your body, no, it's a whole different set of rules for your body, which tells you, somewhat uniquely, that your belongings belong to you more than your body belongs to you. And so again, the process of the mitzvah of burial is a reinforcement of that value. So it's not just a value which affects how a person dies and is buried; it's a value which affects how a person lives. That is. Point number one, reason number one that is given for this myth. And reason number two is connected to another very important Jewish value. Every Friday night in the Shabbos davening, we say the L'chadodi. Most, in most congregations, certainly in Chabad communities, the L'chadodi is sung. And... Uh, each of the stanzas, the Lechadodi, is beautiful, very, very profound, composed and put together by Rabbi Shlomo al Kabetz of Tzfat 500 years ago. But one of the things we say is, Hisnari me'afar kumi, which means, I will awaken and rise from the dust, from the earth. What is that referring to? What is the awakening and rising from the dust of the earth? That's referring to an essential belief within Judaism, which is tchias hames, that all the dead will come back to life. There'll come a point in time in the era of Mashiach that all the dead will come back to life. And the wording that is used is they will rise from the earth. And so therefore, the process of burial is
The process of burial is another way to connect to that value. When a person is buried in the ground, it's almost as if they are buried for safekeeping. That we are burying this individual, this body, until the time that it'll rise from the earth. With the process of Tchiyas Mason. And Tchiyas Mason, this idea of revival of the dead, is not just a, is, is one as the Rambam list, listed as one of the 13 principles of faith. And so therefore this is another idea where burial emphasizes. Now you can argue, well, even we know that a body that is buried also disintegrates in the ground. That's true. But nonetheless, especially today when the alternative is often cremation, whether it is stated overtly or not, cremation is a process of turning the body into dust, turning the body into nothing. And it, send, it sends a message of this is the end, the end of this being, and therefore we will we will turn this body into nothingness. And burial sends a message that safekeeping, safekeeping for the future. And so those are two of the ideas which are explained for this unique mitzvah. I know it's a morbid topic, but it's an important topic, a very important topic. And uh, I know stories personally here in the community and others who uh, were able to influence those around them to go through a proper Jewish burial. So all this highlights the significance of the significance of burial. I remember, uh, I remember uh, there's, again, there's, there's no shortage of, of stories and profound stories which talk about the significance and the, the significance of burial and what Jews have done throughout the ages. But I remember hearing a story, and I apologize, I don't have the details, but how um, there was someone in World War II who, um, who was able to survive by hiding their Jewish identity. And they actually were, this person was an officer in the German army as a Jew. But in the army, in the, not not God, not not in the uh, not in the SS, not in the uh, not in those which were involved in the horrors of of of, of the concentration camps, etc. They were part of the army, whatever that's worth. Anyway, they somehow were able to send a letter to a rabbi asking that in the event that I die, the soldier said, I have several options. I have the option I can put into my uh, request, an option of cremation. The other option is burial. But if I am buried, it'll be as a German soldier with the SS logo on the headstone. because That's the way the soldiers were buried. Because what should I do? The last thing I want is to be buried with a Nazi emblem above my grave. I much prefer the alternative, which is not to have a grave altogether. And the rabbi responded to him, again, one of the very challenging responses of that era. The rabbi responded to him unequivocally that without a doubt, he should choose the option of burial, even if that means to be buried under a Nazi emblem, because burial is a key part of Judaism. And burial, and burial which is a mitzvah, but it's not just a mitzvah, it's a mitzvah which emphasizes um, some of the essential ideas that we live with as Jews. So that's that's the first part of the conversation. But what about the second point, which we mentioned earlier, the idea of um, the idea of burial immediately? So that's that's the next point over here. Ki You go back to uh, verse, uh, the same verse, chapter twenty-one, verse twenty-three. It doesn't just say kavar tikvarenu by yomahu on that day it should be buried. Kavartik Bureno by Yamahu. This becomes the source of immediate burial. And that leaving the body for any period of time between passing and burial is unpleasant for the body. 
unpleasant for the person. We believe the neshama lives on. Now, the halach over here is not that it's not absolute black and white. Halach over here does not say that the that is absolutely required for the body to be buried on that day, the day of its passing. There is some leeway. Very often it takes a day or two. And then there's another, but, but it does convey a value. The value of burial immediately. As soon as possible. Now, what exactly is as soon as possible? Okay, that that that's uh, every situation is different. Every city is different. Every cemetery is different. But what's for certain is that for the body to sit and to wait is not the Jewish way. And I know a couple of years, and and it's the reason that's that's important is because in other circles, the opposite is true is that to give the body a period of time in which people visit and pay tribute is a form of respect. I remember a few years ago when Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, and she was very uh, openly Jewish and a proud Jew, but because of her prestige, so they gave her the what they called respect. And part of that was for a few days, there was viewing. People came to view and pay tribute to her, to, to her by viewing the body. And that's antithetical to Judaism. It is it is not a favor at all. It's considered to be disrespectful to the body for the body to to wait, which is why, as you see, in Jewish circles, the body is buried immediately. Now, one of the exceptions to that is allowing for immediate family members to come into a funeral. So sometimes it may take a day or two or even three for family members to arrive from out of town. And it's acceptable for to allow the body to wait so that it'll be surrounded by loved ones, by family members um, at the funeral. But a, a, every situation has to be honestly evaluated. And that doesn't mean that you could wait, you know, a week for a second cousin to arrive. In other words, we, we, the, the, uh, the value, the point over here is the value of immediate burial has to be first and foremost in one's mind. One, one area where this is taken um, to the uh, highest degree is in Yerushalayim. In Jerusalem, the body does not, and I'm not sure when we say Yerushalayim in the, say, in the books, in the Sfarim, the holy books, it's not clear what Yerushalayim means. Yerushalayim doesn't mean, usually it means the old city of Jerusalem, which is the biblical Jerusalem. But I don't know to what degree that ex extends to other parts of Yerushalayim nowadays. But Yerushalayim, the, a body never remains overnight in Jerusalem. Even though elsewhere you could say overnight or even a second night if necessary. But in Shalayim, bodies do not remain overnight. And there's different opinions given. Rashi says it's just a tradition. It's a Mesoras. It's something which Mesoras be adenu, that a body should not languish overnight in Shalayim. And the uh, Shal Sejuvah Suridvaz says because of the impurity associated with a dead body, and we don't want to add impurity to Jerusalem, which is the holiest and purest place on earth. But this is the, um, the tradition, which is why in Jerusalem, you will find, in Jerusalem, you will find um, that funerals will take place two, three o'clock in the morning in Har Hazis in Mount of Olives. Because as soon as the body is ready to be buried, the body is buried. So Yishalayim, bodies are buried immediately. What is the significance of immediate burial? So again, we spoke about the significance of burial. Burial is because of the body belongs to Hashem. Burial is because uh, of Tzchiyas Mason. But that's accomplished even if the body is buried five days later. So the reasons we gave for burial don't explain why burial should be done immediately. So for this, I want to turn to the uh, to the Zohar. Let's go to some of the uh, secrets, uh, the secret ideas of the Torah. And the Zohar speaks about this and gives. I, I think I may have studied this. Those who joined me last year at this class, I think I may have gone through the Zohar. But it's so fascinating that I want to share it again. The Zohar comments on this puzzle that the body should be buried on that day. Says the Zohar, and the Zohar shares several ideas, but the common theme among them is that when a person passes away, the soul goes through a very 
unique transition and is seeking comfort in its new location, its new reality. Just as birth is a transition into life, there's a transition out of life into the next world. And the soul seeks comfort and the soul only finds comfort <clears throat> once the body that it housed has been buried. Different ideas are shared. I'll share two of them. The Zohar says, the Zohar gives a very specific time frame and says that um, once a person has passed on and 24 hours pass before their burial, it begins to cause pain to the nisham. Furthermore, says the Zohar, one of the concepts that Jewish mysticism talks about is the topic of reincarnation. And that when a neshama expires, when a neshama leaves this world, it is brought before God. And often that neshama then is given, is, is determined that needs to be sent back to earth in another body. And that process cannot happen. The process of giving the neshama a new guf, a new body, cannot take place while the first body is not yet buried. So again, I don't, we're, we're tapping into an area of uh, of Judaism or Jewish knowledge, which is somewhat vague. No one knows exactly. I mean, there were those who knew, but typically we don't have a, a clarity of how it works for the Shema to be, to go through reincarnation, how soon it happens. It would seem that there's a process in between a person, the Shema passing on and being sent back in another body, be that as it may, the first idea the Zohar says is for the neshama to be to move on to its next mission, it cannot do so as long as the body is not buried. And then the Zohar gives a second idea, similar to the first, but but they're with the unique difference. A very beautiful statement. Kashar neshama nefredes minagul. When the soul separates from the body, umivakeshes laalos laolam haba, and wishes to enter the world to come. The soul cannot enter the next world until the neshama, until it is given a new body, but a body of light. The neshama, a neshama always needs a body. The soul always needs a body. But it could be a physical body as we know it. It could also be a spiritual body, a body or enclosed in light. But the neshama needs clothing. The clothing could be the body. The clothing could be, as he says, guf shel ar. And there's only one entity who has both bodies at their disposal. Who is it that has both bodies? Which neshama has both bodies at their disposal? Anyone want to guess? Anybody who's here? Which entity has two bodies at their disposal? Says the Zohar. Eliyahu Anna, Elijah the prophet. Elijah has the clothing of light, which is the neshama of Eliyahu Anavi, wears, so to say, up in heaven. But if you recall, Eliyahu Anavi ascends to heaven with his body. So he has his physical body somewhere as well. And when Eliyahu Anavi is sent on missions here on this earth, we have different st fascinating stories, both in the Talmud and in general in Judaism, about Eliyahu and Avi returning. So then he puts on his physical body. But most of us don't have, most human beings don't have that option. They have one or the other. And therefore, when a person passes away and they are, they, 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 the Neshama yearns for the new body, the, the body, the clothing of light, but it cannot receive that new set of clothing, quote unquote, until their previous body has been buried. So this is a, a very beautiful idea that the Zohar is sharing. And perhaps it'll allow us to view the next funeral you're at. I'm willing to be someone who's 120 years old, living, lived a very long and full life. 
The next time you're at a funeral or at a burial, you'll be able to think about what's actually taking place. And that is that the process of burial is allowing this neshama to soar and to receive its new set of clothing. And this new set of clothing is spiritual, it's clothing of light. Shama Shalar. And that explains the second idea, which is why not only is there a mitzvah to bury, but that the burial is, is, uh, is done immediately. I'll conclude with a uh, with a story. I shared this recently at a class I gave. Sorry that I saw it's repeated. One of the great storytellers nowadays, Jewish storytellers, is a man named Rabbi Yoel Gold, who shares stories, um, not just stories, but he really backs it up with, with the individuals with whom it happened. So he shares a story that took place um, not long ago with a, with a rabbi. His name is Rabbi Stephen Ammon and his wife. And Rabbi, this Mrs. Ammon every year would go to visit her mother's gravesite, I believe, in Staten Island, on Erev Rosh Hashanah. One year, they knew in advance that um, they would not be able to visit on Erev Rosh Hashanah. So she, along with her husband, were driving nearby a couple weeks beforehand, and they happened to pass the exit near this uh, Staten Island Cemetery, which would take them directly to the cemetery. So he turns to his wife and says, you know, we're not gonna be, you're not going to be able to visit our Rosh Hashanah. Let's go now. And they did. So they got off the exit. They went to the cemetery to pray at the gravesite of, of uh, Mrs. Ammon's mother. As they were standing there davening, praying, saying to Hillam. Uh, so apparently he finished earlier and he looked, uh, looked around and he saw something interesting. He saw a, a very small funeral was taking place nearby and they came they brought the the coffin and then everyone was ready to leave and they started leaving and he was shocked because they hadn't buried or they, they placed the coffin in the ground but they hadn't filled it up <clears throat> with dirt he went over there and he said you know we're supposed to fill it up so they said no no we'll have the workers come they'll take care of it and the tractors they'll be able to do it now, in Judaism, we not only bury, but we we want it's a great mitzvah to be part of the process and to help fill the 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 uh, to cover the body with earth. So he said to them, you know what? He says, I'll take care of it. Don't don't. Uh, or, or perhaps a moment later, when the workers started coming, he says, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do this myself. And he stood there and he and he filled the uh, the the hole the in the ground and he covered the the coffin and he completed this mitzvah entirely on his own. And um, and then he picked up his wife and they and they they drove back home. And he was driving and he was he was very um, he was just surprised at this opportunity. It was I mean he wasn't supposed to be there that day. He uh, he happened randomly was there and um, and and one thing as before he left he took note of the name of the person. There was a little uh, tag which said the name of the person who was who was being buried. Um. And all right, he kept his mind. He, at some point, he had over the next couple of days, he had a conversation with his rabbi, his mentor, who was a man named Rabbi Newberger in Yeshiva in Baltimore, near Yisrael. So Rabbi Newberger has a nephew here who has the Yeshiva in Moonfield. But anyway, he was talking to uh, his rabbi and he shared with him what happened. And then at the end of the conversation, he says, and, and then I took note of the name of this guy and he told his rabbi his name. When his rabbi heard the name, he was shocked, expressed it over the phone. He says he couldn't believe it. So, uh, so Rabbi Ammon says, well, what's, what's so surprising? He says, I know who that person is. That person has a very unique connection to you. He said, because 30 years ago, when you came here to Yeshiva, and you came from Seattle, and at some point while you were here, the finances for your family took it down to your father lost his job, and he told us he was unable to pay tuition. Now, we weren't going to send you home, but I needed to find someone who would help pay for your tuition. And that's what I did. I looked, I called, made some focus. I found someone who was going to pay for your tuition to study here in Yeshiva. And that someone, said Rabbi Neuberger to Rabbi Ammon, was this man that you just helped bury. That person paid for a, whatever period of time, paid for you to be able to study in Yeshiva. And here we are 30 years later in which you fulfill the ultimate mitzvah of taking care of them in their final journey. 
And it was really full circle. Because Rabbi Yemen said, the only way I knew about the value of Judaism to bury and to be a participant was because I studied in the yeshiva. So the person who gave me that knowledge is the one who I ended up using that knowledge to help and give them the uh, beauty of a honorable, an honorable burial. And so this is the uh, this is the story that is that is that is shared. But the point over here is that while death and burial is obviously not a comfortable topic, it's not an enjoyable topic. But nonetheless, the Jewish approach to it is very beautiful. The Jewish approach to burial and the values that it conveys, whether it's the value of returning my body to Hashem, whether it's the value of of um, recognizing that the body is going to be returned to life, and therefore we're just placing it in the ground for storekeeping, or the value that the neshama in its journey is about to be given a new body. And the only way it gets its new, its guf shal ur, as Azar says, its body of light is when its previous body is placed in the ground. These are beautiful values that Judaism shares, even on a topic which is uh, perhaps a unhappy uh, topic. So thank you all for joining. With that, we'll conclude today's class. And um, I look forward to... Continuing our studies next week, God willing.